Good evening and good morning to everyone. I am Biko Kai Supir on Buddha Sasana program of CBMS, the Cambodian Buddhist Monk Society in USA, broadcasting from Long Beach, California. Today, we are going to talk about the Four Noble Truth. But before we begin, let me start by paying homage to the Triple Gym, the Buddha, Dhamma, and the Sangha, with my higher respect. And at the same time, also would like to pay respect to all venerable monks uh, around the world, and my respect to uh, all people who are watching this program. Welcome to Buddha Sasana program, and especially to venerable monks here, venerable Yon Seng Yeet from Boston, Massachusetts, and Venerable Dhamma, Dhamma Pala from Des Moines, Iowa. So thank you for joining us to discuss on this topic. As you all know that most of the Buddhist uh, people are very familiar with this uh, Four Noble Truths. But for those are non-Buddhist, might not be uh, familiar with this topic. So we want to explore and explain and share the perspective on this topic. As you all know that a definable truth is, is the heart of the teachings of the Buddha. So it is important for all of us to, to try to understand so we could uh, adapt, adapt our, our life with the uh, difficult situation that we are facing every day, especially uh, during this pandemic. So once again, Welcome uh, and thanks to both of you for joining us. So I would like to start with Venerable Dhammapala first. Uh, as you are very expert in the talk with you on this topic. So we are going to uh, discuss in this uh, Dhamma Jaka Bhavatana Sutta. So which is mentioned the Four Noble Truth and we will go further on the Eightfold Path. So uh, we can share. So. First of all, what can you, what can you tell us, and what are those honorable truths that uh, you would like to share to the people? How can uh, ordinary people like like us understand these uh, honorable truths, and how important it is to 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 every one of us uh, to 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 pick up to pick it up and 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 put into practice? So, could you please share with us? Thank you, Venerable Pandey Dhammapala. Uh, I, I, I missed a lot of that. It's kind of breaking. Oh, uh, maybe uh, the four. Yeah. Maybe, I mean, you can just uh, say the the meaning of the four noble truths and describe uh, how how important it is for all of us. Thank you. The f yes, the four noble truths. Um, as you said, the four noble truths are the the heart of the Buddhist teaching, and. The first noble truth, I, I, I explain them as four facts. Um, they are factual, they are objective. Uh, anyone can check them out. It's, it doesn't require any belief. Uh, it's, it's knowledge. You can, you can check this for yourself and I encourage you to do so. The first noble truth is the noble truth of uh, I'm going to use some Pali words here, and then I'll I'll translate them into English. the The first noble truth is the noble truth of dukkha, and as with many Pali words, uh, they they have many different ways to translate them to English. The most common translation for dukkha is suffering, uh, but that to me is not the best. Um, I prefer to to say that dukkha is dissatisfactoriness. That we have times in our lives that our life is less than satisfactory. And that can vary from a little bug flying around that you wish would go away to to a serious illness like like COVID-19 or, or cancer or uh, being involved in a serious automobile wreck, a, a very serious pain and suffering. 
So dukkha is a word that encompasses, it includes a whole range of dissatisfactoriness with life. The, the second noble, and I can talk for hours on dukkha. <laughs> the, the second noble truth is the cause of this dissatisfactoriness, the cause of dukkha. And it, what is so profound and so simple at the same time is that dukkha is natural. It's not something that has befallen us because of, of uh, uh, you know, something like uh, uh, some god or gods punishing us, or or it, it's part of our human nature. When we're born, well, I'll, I'll say two words: avija and tanha. Avija is uh, unwisdom. Uh, it's often translated as ignorance and delusion. Tanha literally means thirst but it's thirst as in the sense of of uh, emotionally charged desire uh thirst in the sense of craving uh it is a, 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 an attachment to the object of desire an emotional attachment most generally and w when babies are born they have no knowledge they have no wisdom they're in a, a state of total avidya, total ignorance. And Tanha rules their total existence. I want. I want this. I want that. I want it now. And if I don't get it, then I'm going to throw a temper tantrum. I'm going to fuss and scream <laughs> and cry and maybe pound the floor and kick my heels. So uh, this is part of human nature. This is the way we are at birth. And the third noble truth is that we can, through discipline, through practice, through uh, techniques, if you want to call it that, we can gain in knowledge and wisdom. And we can get over ourselves. We can, we can learn to delay, delay postpone, or, or even just totally abandon this striving for for self gratification. Um, the fourth noble truth, and again, these are all facts, they can be checked out. The fourth noble truth is that discipline. It's uh, the noble eightfold path. And there are eight aspects to it. And it's really very simple. You can sit down and in 15 minutes memorize all eight of the aspects of the eightfold path. Um, it's elegant in that sense. Uh, however, when you begin to study and you begin to practice and, and you, you begin to uh, live a life that has you on the Eightfold Path, um, it becomes very profound. It, it just opens up uh, whole realms of, of understanding. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Venerable. So, you know, I want to go a little bit details in this, you know, as you have mentioned about the unsatisfactoriness you know, yes. it is a part of a uh, human nature. Yes. But, you know, uh, I want I would like to turn this question to Venerable uh, Dr. Yan Seng Yit uh, to explore on this, uh, the first one, the Dukkha. As you know, as you know, sometimes we, we as, as human being, we, we, uh, we don't, we don't want to accept it, you know, because like, every time we experiencing suffering or unsatisfactoriness in our life, we just want, no, I don't want it, I just want to push it away. But you know, by rejecting the unsatisfactoriness, by by denying it uh, without opening our heart to understand its natures, and it, it's going to be difficult for us to 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 overcome uh, to overcome it. So I would like to uh, ask Venerable John Singh to explain. So as as in, in Buddhist perspective, how can we how can we uh, accept? I mean, like as an ordinary people, I accept the the dukkha. That, that it is part of our life. Sometimes we experience it, sometimes we, you know, a, in a matter of time, it's gone and then it come back again. So in order to to prevent it from its severity, what can we as a, as a, as a, as a Buddhist or as, a, as a, a Buddhist follower, how can we, how can we put this into understanding? So 
Now, thank you. So could you please share with us your perspective on the first Tuka? Thank you. <clears throat> My respect to the most vulnerable monks here and um, the vulnerable truth is uh, touched in the sutra called Dhammakarapotana Sutra. It is the first sutra uh, preached by the Buddha after um, a long time of his traveling in Sankara. So uh, just after the enlightenment, he declares the or he preached the sutra to his uh, associates, whom we know as Phi Panyavaki Bhikkhu. And this five five people were the person who listened to this uh, sermon, this preaching. And the vulnerable truth is a course teaching of the Buddha, which he tell uh, he, he told to the five because saying that this is the the reality of life that human beings are facing and uh, you know when we are talking about the truth it is not about whether we accept it or not because this is the reality and in this formulas uh, there are four of them which venerable dhammapala already uh, explain it so I don't want to go into detail about it. I just want to focus on the first uh, dukkha, uh, the first truth, uh, which we know we know that it is called the truth of dukkha. The Buddha clearly uh, taught that uh, in this light there is a dukkha. And I'm, I'm not going to go into detail how we can translate this, the word dukkha in English, because I'm not a Tainese speaker. Verbo Dhammapala might have a better understanding than me, but we can learn this term from the the, the Pali words, the, the son of Pali that we, we came across. Uh, dukkha is something we is not happy, which Venerable Dhammapala uh, term it as unsatisfactoriness, uh, but at the same time, the word dukkha is uh, explained about the process of uh, ever changing the situation in our life. One something which is changing is called dukkha, and the other meaning is something which is not happy, which is not satisfactory, is called dukkha. And answering to your question whether the human beings exhibit or not, it is not the question because this is a part of our life. Whether we like it or we call it or we exhibit that reality or not, it doesn't matter. For example, the, fire, the nature of fire is hot. Whether you agree that the fire is hot or cool, it doesn't matter, but if we touch the fire, it is hot. So in this uh, truth, the Buddha, Taught that in this slide there is a dukkha, and in that sutra also he mentioned four kinds. Oh no, sorry, uh, twelve kinds of dukkha. Start with jati, jara, jati, and marana. And in that we uh, determine Pali as soka parete wa dukkha dukkha, which I can uh, use in English term as something is not happy, which had been. Uh, explained in different terms, but uh, the, the word dukkha itself is denoted something which is not happy. So the first thing as a Buddhist, as a practitioner, it would be a, a great failure for us if we cannot accept that this life is changing and facing the uncertainties or the unsatisfactoriness. This is the starting point of the practice if we are fail if we fail to understand that this lie is under the nature of changing or under the nature of unsatisfactoriness that is the failure of the practice 
So this is my answer. Sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. So when about Dhammapala, as uh, when about Dr. Yansen Yid has mentioned about about this dukkha, it is not a matter of of uh, accepting uh, this dukkha or not, but but it is the the it is the reality within uh, within everyone's uh, mind. So as a Buddhist, how can we train our mind? <laughs> you know. <laughs> As a, how can we train our mind? You know, when 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 it's it's not whether you if you accept it or not, you know, it, it, um, because it's there. So how as a Buddhist, how how can how can we train our mind to live with this kind of dukkha, so we can we we can have more a you know power than 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 it's uh than than dukkha's power that uh, okay. uh, that uh, run over us. So <laughs> what can you share with us, and how can we train our mind to live with this? Well. Power? The, the training of the mind is the practice, the, the putting into everyday life of the Noble Eightfold Path. Um, right knowledge. We, we need to examine what, what is being presented to us. Is it true? Is it factual? Is it correct? Uh, right intention or, or right aspiration? Uh, dukkha is the problem, and so as we as we act, as we speak, is our intention to reduce or minimize dukkha or or not? Uh, uh, right speech. Uh, we need to speak factually. We need to refrain from saying that which is not true. We need to uh, refrain from speaking badly about other people uh, 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 about. Uh, just good practice, good communication skills. Uh, when someone says something, make sure that we understand that what they said and what we heard are the same. So, and, and right action, uh, the five, beginning with the, the five moral precepts, right lifestyle, right livelihood, uh, right effort. We have to make the effort. And, and here's where most people think about what is Buddhist practice. And that is uh, uh, samasati and samasamati, right mindfulness and right samadhi. And I'm going to speak a little bit about samadhi in a moment, but right mindfulness is just paying attention, being aware, being keenly aware, uh, really, really uh, bringing our attention down to a single focus. And we practice this by focusing on the breath. We sit comfortably and easily and close the eyes. We bring our attention to our breathing. We train our mind to focus by focusing on the breath. And, you know, then we, our mind wanders away as natural uh, behavior is, uh, is something we hear, something we hear and goes to that. We have a thought. And then we come back to the breath. That's samasati, right mindfulness. Samasamati. Samadhi is, is one of those words that has, it's very rich in meaning. It has multiple, multiple understandings. Uh, samadhi is both a practice and a state of being. Uh, and uh, it's often translated as right concentration or right absorption or right meditation. But to give you an example of the state of being of samadhi, uh, some folks have been so involved in reading a book that everything else is, is out of their consciousness. They're only reading the book. And then somebody walks in and slams a door and they have this startled response because they were, they were so focused, they were absorbed, they were concentrated on that book. We, we, we first learn to, to be mindful. And uh, uh, part of that is uh, learning to relax and to focus. And then we can begin to pay attention to the space between thoughts, to the silence between words, and begin to pay attention to what is, is not generally an object of consciousness. And ultimately, the state of samadhi is the state of consciousness without an object, uh, uh, awareness without an 
object of awareness. It's just pure consciousness or pure awareness. And this is a practice. You need to practice all eight. Just doing one is not sufficient. It's necessary, but not sufficient. And you need a guide. You need someone to, to help you see your way along the path. Yes. Yeah. So, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mary, for bringing up the Eightfold Path. So it is important for all of us as a as a Buddhist practitioner to to uphold to practice this Eightfold Path because it is the only way, the only path that that leads us to happiness. So I would like to turn another question to Venerable Yon Saint here on on the second one. You know, the cause of dukkha. You know, the cause of dukkha I can put into uh, the three things, the three uh, the three evil acts that that generally cause dukkha though are the three i can just put it the three poisonous you know the the the, the greed the hatred and the delusions this is the we can we, we don't i don't want to go too uh, broadly but this is very simple that you know greed and hatred and delusion this could be a main cause of suffering so as a buddhist practitioner as a or in the buddha's teaching how can we suppress this you know this 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 uh this evil Evil acts or is the, uh, these uh, these three things that 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 can, that could help us to sustain our happiness because if we are we are follow uh, if we do not know how to suppress this you know greed hatred you know when we you know sometimes we just uh, easily get angry and and then that will cause a lot of suffering to us so so I want I want I want just to explain as a, as a Buddhist practitioner and as uh, as a general understanding. How can we reduce these uh, three things in order to sustain our happiness, in order to overcome this this kind of dukkha? So thank you. So can you help to share with us? I can hear you. Oh. Can, can you hear me? Okay, now, okay, I can hear you. Now. Okay, we are living with the uh, the the attachment, the the tanha, the defilements, meaning that. Uh, this the time uh, this uh, defilement is is part of us is within us so we cannot suppress it but the best way is to live along with it with a very effective remedies which had been uh, explained clearly by venerable Dhammapala just now uh, with the practice of the eight uh, uh, path and it's it is very hard for us as patuchina as a ordinary person either because uh even though we are monks we are still patuchina we are still ordinary person in terms of the uh, the practice we are not arahanta we are not the noble person who had attained a very high stage of practice but I can share a very simple practice with the audiences, especially the one who is uh, aspire to, to practice uh, the Buddha's teaching. The first thing that we must accept is this life is full of suffering, but it is not, we are living with everyday suffering because this life is made up of the attachment so there is no way that we can got, get rid of ourselves so first thing we have to accept that and second thing is uh, the cause of the suffering which had been termed in the for the world truth as samudhiya uh, tanaha uh, you raise a question of how we can uh, first how we can uh, reduce uh, this uh, hatred, this illusion, and we do have uh, a way to practice uh, in order to live with this uh, attachment. So the practice of uh, the noble eight food parts, which explained by Venerable Dhammapala, is that is the the recommended or the 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 path that taught by the Buddha. So I don't want to repeat it, Venerable Sir, because the audience uh, already lis uh, listened to the Venerable Dhammapala of what, what are the Noble Eightfold Parts. Okay. 
<laughs> thank you, thank you so much. Uh, so, yes, the one of the things that we can uh, we can reduce this this kind of dukkha is through our right understanding, right speech, and uh, on you know observing our actions and and more importantly observing our our thoughts because it is the it is the core of 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 producing our actions that could lead to suffering so uh, venerable dhammapala in in dhamma jaka pavatana sutta the buddha has mentioned about you know two things i i want to bring it up here the kama sukalakani yoko and the atamatana yoko so you know a the, the first one, the Kama Kalakana Yoko, is, is pleasures. People are, uh, uh, you know, not generally we think that uh, uh, pleasures is, is the core of, 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 of giving us the happiness. But at the same time, for those uh, a serious practitioner, you know, like, like the Buddhas before he got enlightenment, uh, he tortured himself. Uh, in order to burn to to burn out these defilements, uh, the, uh, the, the, the desire for six years, and then he realized that you know torturing our our self, torturing our body, when uh, when when uh, help us to to get enlightenment. So, well, about these two things. So, uh, Venerable Dhammapala, can how uh, what uh, what can you tell us? What can you share with us on these uh, Dhamma Jaka Sutras? These two things and. So it's important for all of us, you know. Sometimes we want uh, some. Sometimes people go go extremely uh, on on torturing of ourselves. Some some people are, you know, once on the pleasures through their sensuality, that they think that this is this is the ultimate one. But how can we walk into the, the middle path of this? How can how can you put this into understanding in in, in a simple way? Thank you, Venerable uh, Dhamma, Dhamma, Dhamma Can you share with us? Thank you. Well, very simply. How we do it is we do it. We make a commitment to do it. Uh, my, my PhD is in, in psychology, so, so I tend to use uh, psychological terms sometimes. But uh, it, it's well known in, in Western thought uh, for 3,000 years. It's been well known in Western thought that um, this drive for self-gratification that I mentioned, tanha, if you will, uh, we, we strive for pleasure and we avoid pain. Well, the, 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 one of the insights of, of the Buddha was that we can strive for pleasure and strive for pleasure and strive for pleasure and we can get pleasure. We can have pleasure every day. Uh, life is filled with with moments of dukkha but there's also moments of sukha mo moments of happiness moments of satisfactoriness but as was pointed out they are temporary they are are transitional they arise they abide a while and then they go away and so if we try to make them permanent we try to do use these external sources to, to attain permanent pleasure. We're, we're going to fail. We're doomed. It, it, it doesn't work. Uh, and so, and too many people say, well, I'll just settle for, you know, what I can get. And, and that's, that's not good enough either. Um, the, the other uh, teaching is, is that, um, uh, uh, this life of asceticism, this self-mortification, this denial of, of, of food, of clothing, of shelter from, from the weather, uh, of medical care. That's not good either. That's, that was a, a uh, was and still is a, a practice in many of the world's uh, uh, faiths, uh, Hinduism, and there are Christian ascetics, and, and uh, uh, but, but that doesn't work either uh, and and i think it's important to note that this total immersion in in self-denial in in trying to burn out the the uh, uh hatred and delusion and and uh, just 
trying to do it without some plan, without some program, work. Seeking pleasure without some understanding of the nature of pleasure, that doesn't work. And I just have to come back to the Noble Eightfold Path. That works. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, so it, it is. It's a very simple that you know if we we, we remember those eightfold paths and 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 dealing with our daily activities, so we could understand it. So, uh, uh, now I would it, like to send that. It, it's simple, but it's not easy. We have to yes. make the effort. But I know that you know mo mostly we 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 can talk a lot. You know, I mean, like uh, days and night, but. When put those things into practice, it's extremely difficult because sometimes our mind is is not strong enough to to face the reality, and and it often it often drags us into into a bad situation when we are facing this uh, reality. So, whenever you are saying yet uh, the, the third one, you know, the cessation of suffering or cessation of dukkha. This is the third of the vulnerable truth. I would like to touch a little bit on this. How, how can we understand it? Uh, what can you explain to us the session of suffering? How can we end it? I mean, like, uh, of course, uh, it's going to be like <laughs> the eightfold path again, uh, because it is the it is the, it is the only. But how can you explain it to people, to our audiences, into a simple way? And and you know, how can we put those those practices into practice by understanding this, this teaching of the Buddha. Thank you. Can hear you. Can you hear me? Too? Okay, 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 okay. Okay. The Four Noble Truth is the formula promulgated by the Buddha and which he uh, taught uh, to the humanity that this is the formula which we can use it in order to understand what is going on in our life how to because this vulnerable truths bear two fruits one thing if we understand it and we know how to use it effectively we will be able to attain a happiness but if we cannot understand this vulnerable truths then our, uh, uh, it is it it, uh, it it is impossible for us to walk out of these uh, sufferings, this uh, unhappiness. So this this vulnerable truth is a formula, which we have already spent I think maybe twenty minutes together talk about. The first one is dukkha. There there is a misunderstanding, especially not only in the West, but only in the East too. That some people saying that. Buddhism teaches only about the suffering. If we practice Buddhism, this religion teaches only suffering. Actually, no. Life is not only suffering. Life is about getting of the suffering and understanding about the suffering. So that is the first uh, truth, Dukkha. The second one is Samudhiya. Buddha said, that the, the Buddha saying that if we, if we the first thing, if we understand the dukkha, then we must understand what is the reason why there is a dukkha, why there is a unsatisfactoriness, why there is the unpleasantness. So the first, the second one is the Buddha teach us to 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 find out what's the root cause of the problem. Let's say dukkha is problem, then now in our life there is a problem, and then, and then in the final world truth, the second one is to understand what is the root cause of the suffering. And the third one is in order to uh, end this suffering or reuse this suffering, it is called the cessation of suffering, Dukkha Nirota Araya Sancha. And again, once again, I turn to the Noble Eight Food Parts. This is a very simple understanding, but people must try to understand it. We cannot just uh, see it and understand it. People just, first thing, very simple don't 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 try to make it complicated first we must accept that this lie is full of suffering it means that something is changing in our life second one uh, the, uh, there is a reason that leading to the suffering this secret this suffering happened because there are some root cause of it uh, suffering cannot happen without the the the, the root cause of which we call it the samudhiya. And the third one, this suffering 
uh, can be ended, meaning that there is a way to cessation of the suffering. So the Buddha clearly told tell us that the suffering in our, in our life can be ended, can be eradicated. So the third one is must understand, we must accept that this suffering can be eradicated without turning to the external force. Like some people believe that our life is controlled by someone outside in the outside of the earth or living in the universe. Uh, blah 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 but the buddha say no this suffering must be eradicated by ourselves we must accept that we must accept that and it is true because the buddha is the one who already came across it who already walked that path and achieved it so he said that this this suffering can be can be uh, stopped can be ended by ourselves so this is the the the, the understanding of the third suffering uh, which you, you you tell me some people when there is something wrong in our life they turn to other uh, they, they turn to other forces for help but Buddha, the buddha say no no that is not the way we must accept that if there is something wrong in our life we our child is the one who put it to an end so this is the meaning of the third suffering the cessation and and the Buddha clearly explained in the Dhamma Chakapavatana Sutta that there is no anything which happened without cause. Because there, is, there, 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 there must be something, there must be a cause which leads to that suffering, lead, leads to that happiness, or lead to that issue, lead, lead to that troubles. And that trouble can be eradicated. So this is a very simple understanding. Don't try to turn it for, uh, to turn to other beings or unseen beings or mighty gods or whatever. He said that this is our work, our duties to end it by ourselves. And we can do it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your explanation. It's worth, it was very clear. And I also want, uh, let, let me ask, let me continue with you, Dr. Uh, Venerable Dhammapala. So, because because this uh, he uh, Venerable Yantini has explained about the cessation of the dukkha, and now you know, I, I I just I'm curious, you know, on this, you know, how can we how can we develop our right understanding, you know, mostly when we experience when we experience suffering, you know, for example here you know, the pandemic, you know, we are trying to put the blame, we are trying to accuse people, we are trying to you know slander to someone else that. This that person, this particular person is creating suffering to me. We, we, we usually we you know through our six senses, we you know for without without uh, without thinking carefully, you know we immediately putting a blame on others. Uh, this person, that person. It's not just the pandemic, but in our daily life, you know sometimes we experience suffering and we usually we don't look uh, inside ourselves, mm -hmm. and we usually you know look for the outsider you know uh, blaming the others things that causes suffering so how can we develop i, I just uh, in, in the uh, you know western perspective how can we develop our right understanding uh, uh, to uh, to all of this you know in order to understand the real cause of our of our suffering that then we can put an end to it so can you share with us this uh, right understanding thank you uh, yes, uh, I, I'll use an analogy here. Uh, what is the cause of fire? Uh, well, we have three factors, three things that cause fire. We must have fuel. Uh, we must have oxygen. And we must have some source of heat. So to understand the cause of fire, we can go find a fire someplace and we can take away the fuel and the fire will go out. Or we can take away the oxygen by smothering it and the fire will go out. Or we can build everything that's necessary for a fire, but not add the match, not add the source of heat. So the way we do it is by critically observing, 
critically thinking and by comparing what we're seeing and hearing from other people, what other people say, what our experience in life is, comparing that with what is already known. Um, uh, if, if I walk into a house and there's a fire, I know from, from prior knowledge that if I can smother the fire, if I can get a fire extinguisher and put foam on it, the fire will go out. We have the fires of passion. So we need to be aware of our passions. We need to be aware of the consequences of our passions. Everything we do has consequences, good consequences, bad consequences, neutral consequences. It doesn't matter. Everything we do has consequences. So we need to be aware. We're back to, to samasati, uh, right and mindfulness. But we need to apply right knowledge. We need to examine our intention. If I want to, okay, the opposite of intention is accident. Oh, I, I didn't intend that to happen. I, I, I didn't mean for that to happen. Uh, that was an accident. So if we're not living intentionally, we're living our lives accidentally. And we need to practice. Look at our heart. Look at our mind. What are we thinking? Look at our heart. What are we feeling? What is our intention? Look at our speech and our action. Do those have dukkha uh, suppressing, dukkha minimizing uh, uh, results, consequences, or do they do they set up the field for dukkha? It, it, you know, it's a practice. We have to do it. We have to do it and do it and do it. And when we begin to do it, we begin to understand. I see how it works. Thank you. Thank you, Venerable, for, for your explanation. So we, I just would like to inform you that we have a few minutes left. And so lastly, I would like to give you each uh, one or two minutes uh, to share your perspective. So what can we learn from this, uh, this dukkha, this, uh, this vulnerable truth? And as, a, as an ordinary people, uh, how can we put it into practice? And how can we, you know, you know how can we live with it? generally you know because like most um, most of us when we experience experience the unsatisfactoriness you know sometimes we are but for those who are who, whose mind is weak we usually couldn't handle it so i would like both of you to to share your perspective uh, perspective on this and how can you give your message of encouragement to the general people who might be you know experiencing suffering or you know they have many different level of suffering so uh, what would be the simple message from both of you? So I would like to start with Venerable Johnson get first, and then one will them apart. Thank you. My my humble suggestion to the practitioner is, uh, um, we don't need to practice the fundamental truth for nibbana. I think it's too hard for us as a simple practitioners. But we can use this fundamental truths to apply in our families in our daily life. First thing, if there is something, uh, there is uh, problems. First thing that we must do is don't try to throw that problem to someone. We must accept that there is, this is a problem. The second one, we must try to find out what is the root of this problem. What is the root cause that lead to these problems? And the third one is uh, we must be sh be sure that this problem how we can eradicate or how can we tackle these problems. And the fourth one is find the ways how to do it. So this is a very simple formula which we can use it to apply in our daily life and make sure that we are human beings and we are the one who master, who control our, our life. Don't try to find someone from outside worlds or the unseen beings to come into our life and to do things first. And there is no option for us to get out of this life because we, we have to live it. So the, the, the first thing, is, the, the, the most important thing is we must sail through these difficulties in life. And the process in this life itself, also we can find a happiness. So don't, 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 don't try to 
to see things as negatively that this life is very difficult this life is very hard this life is full of suffering no 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 and each and every life on earth share this almost the same similarities of how we are facing in our life so my simple suggestion is face it by using this uh, vulnerable truths to apply in our daily life thank you sir thank you thank you so much so now venerable damapala so what it would, what would be your message to the people thank you i i i i would agree that that we have a formula it's a four-part formula and if we can approach every situation in life with that four-part for formula that's a good start but earlier i said it's important to have a guide i think it's very very important to to have a teacher to to have someone who is knowledgeable and skilled in the practice and to go to them and say oh i did this and i'm trying to do that and can you can you help help me refine my practice um there is a a, a book and it is the most popular book among Theravada Buddhists. And that book is called the Dhammapada. Dhammapada. <laughs> Dhamma. <laughs> the Dhammapada. Yeah, okay. it's me. No. Uh, and, and I would encourage people to, in whatever their native language is, uh, whatever language they're most comfortable with, get a copy of the Dhammapada and start <laughs> reading it. Uh, read a verse or two or five every day and then think about it. Use the four-part formula of, uh, of uh, dukkha, the cause of dukkha, the succession of dukkha, and the path that leads to it. The, the, the technique. Uh, identify the problem. Identify the cause of the problem. Look around for what other people have used for solutions. And then apply that, apply that technique. But guide yourself with some reading. Uh, the, the Dhammapada is excellent. Uh, there's hundreds, thousands, perhaps, of good books out there if, if you want to, uh, to have a good guide. If you want to do it the Buddhist way, practice all eight of the Eightfold Path. Thank you so much. Yes, we... Thank you. <laughs> you know, we, we, can, we can have the Dhammapada a copy of it <laughs> because like we are going to invite you for the next topic you know we will discuss about it so when you want to hear what would you add okay can, can, can i say a few, yes, yes, a few yes. words yeah very very short one um uh especially for our audience uh, uh for the lay people in uh, particular uh please don't try to live your life as a monastic life this is a disaster <laughs> okay. Yes. <laughs> uh, because uh, for Buddhism, it's applicable to monastics as well as the householders. So please try to practice what is taught for the householders. And if you really want to start, want to practice, to live your life as monastic, be ordained and practice it. But don't try to mix up with these two way of life because if we mix up these two way of life, monastic life with the household life, then you it doesn't bear any result at all. This is a big misunderstanding for our practitioners. If you are a father, you are a mother, you are a son, please rest, please try to practice the way that it had been taught in Buddhism how to be a good father how to be a good mother, how to be, be a good children. This is the best practice recommended by the Buddha. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So it is for me personally, it is an honor for, for me to have both of you on the show, on the talk, sharing knowledge to the people. So to the people, this is a Buddha Sasana program, sharing knowledge from the CBMS. Uh, we thank you for watching uh, this program and this program are going to uh, broadcast every Saturday at 5 p.m. in California times and 7 p.m. or 8 p.m. in Boston and uh, in the Midwest. So join us again. We hope uh, you all have a good day and 
and please stay safe and be mindful uh, in, in living your life with this uh, pandemic because without mindfulness oh, yes. you can uh, you cannot uh, uh, live uh, safely so uh, lastly thank you again uh, for watching with us and may all of you be healthy and stay safe thank you so much see you again Venerable. Thank you, Venerable.